This is Papyrus 52, the oldest New Testament fragment ever excavated. It's a tiny piece of parchment containing just a few lines from John's Gospel. On one side of that paper, there is a short question posed to Jesus. Are you the King of the Jews? On the other side is his answer. A king I am. In Matthew's Gospel, the very first role attributed to Jesus is that of king. It begins with a long, dry list of names, the ancestry of Jesus. Several kings are mentioned in this genealogy, which is important because birthright was an essential claim to kingship. But the kingly allusions run deeper. Within this family tree, Matthew highlights three sets of 14 generations. This might seem like a random coincidence to us, but for Matthew's original Jewish audience, the number 14 was associated with Israel's greatest king, King David. You see, the Hebrew language of that time used letters from their alphabet to signify numbers. So if we look at the Hebrew word for David, we see that the numeric value of the word is 4 plus 6 plus 4. 14. In this seemingly dry, boring opening to Matthew's Gospel, we find a family tree that is saturated with kingly allusions. Matthew's message is clear. This man we will read about is a king. You don't need to walk far in any direction in New York to run into a Christian church or cathedral. They're everywhere. In fact, some of them rank among the most beautiful and iconic buildings in the city. They're impressive. And one look at these grand palatial structures is all it takes to see that for a great many people, Jesus' role as a king is extremely important. After his genealogy, Matthew's Gospel continues with kingly allusions through a birth narrative in which wise men travel from the East, seeking Jesus, asking King Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Shortly after this, Matthew then gives an account of Jesus being tested in the wilderness. In the final temptation, the tempter offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory if Jesus simply were to bow down and worship him. But Jesus the king refused to bow down to any other. At this point in the Gospel narrative, the kingly illusions dissipate. But they return in full force in a way one might not expect when this hero of the Gospels is killed on the cross. The cross is a common image in New York, and it's certainly the dominant symbol of Christianity. As a piece of iconography, it means a great deal to many people bringing up profound feelings of hope, of forgiveness, of love and salvation. But in Jesus' time, seeing a cross brought up very different emotions. This is the heel bone of a young man who was crucified sometime in the first century. It is the only archaeological discovery of a crucifixion nail still in the bone. 
it is one of our few remaining physical glimpses into the horrors of crucifixion. Today, sites like this, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, believed by some to be built on the site where Jesus was crucified, create a sacred space for Christians to contemplate the cross. But in Jesus' time, the cross meant something very different. What is sometimes forgotten is that the Roman cross was actually a torture device designed to inflict a massive amount of pain over an extended period of time. Even more, the Romans used the cross as a spectacle, as crucifixions frequently took place in very public places. Those who were subjected to the torture of crucifixion were forced to spend their final hours naked in agony before masses of spectators. This practice was viewed as so shameful and degrading that Roman citizens were exempt from it. It was reserved only for foreigners, slaves and criminals of the worst kind. Perhaps most horrifying of all, it was frequently not the act of crucifixion itself that caused death, but the exposure to wild animals, which sometimes lasted days. The cross may be celebrated and worshipped now, but in Jesus' time, it was the ultimate symbol of shame and death. When you read through the Gospel accounts of Jesus' murder, there's a strange technique that all four writers use of describing this grotesque death in language that's saturated with kingly, royal allusions. For instance, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he's referred to as a king riding on a donkey. The Roman soldiers place a robe around him, bow before him, and mockingly hail him. The sharp thorns that are thrust on Jesus' head, essentially a torture device, are referred to by the Gospel writers as a crown. Finally, this instrument of his shame and death, the cross, is adorned with a sign that reads, King of the Jews. Strangely enough, for the Gospel writers, Jesus' cross was not a symbol of shame and death. It was a throne on which this revolutionary king was crowned. This image, the Alexamenos Graffita, is believed to be the earliest surviving depiction of Jesus. Befitting the beliefs of the time, it portrays a mocking, degrading presentation of Jesus' crucifixion. In it, Jesus is depicted with the head of a donkey hanging dejectedly on a cross, while a young man looks up, worshipping him. The text, written in crude Greek, mockingly reads, Alexamenos worships his God. The earliest believers in Jesus were frequently subjected to mockery and much worse for their belief in someone who died such a shameful death. But for them and the Gospel writers, Jesus' death was not a shameful moment of failure. It was His revolution's greatest triumph. One of the strange things about the Gospel's depiction of Jesus' death is that it's not at all presented as a failure, but rather as something that he went into willingly, something that he allowed to happen. When soldiers came to arrest him in the garden, Jesus did not put up a resistance. John's Gospel even highlights that he commanded the soldiers to not take his disciples. When he was on trial, before the religious leaders and then before Pilate, he gave no words of defense. He simply allowed the process to play itself out. Moreover, the Gospels also highlight several instances in which Jesus actually predicted his own death. So why would Jesus predict his own death? Some skeptics argue that after their leader had died, the Gospel writers invented a narrative in which he predicted his death. But really, when you look at Jesus' life, when you examine his teachings, and what his revolution was all about, really his death was inevitable. The way Jesus died on a cross was the ultimate humiliation. Interestingly, this ties very closely with Jesus' life and teachings. 
in which he introduced an entirely new way of thinking into the world. One in which humility was not a shame, but a virtue. The first century Greco-Roman world was an honor-based society. Acquiring honor for oneself, one's family, and one's country was the greatest thing one could aspire to. In the 147 Delphic Maxims of Ethical Life, there is not one mention of humility. In fact, in all of history before Jesus, there is little to no evidence of humility ever being considered a virtue. Even the Greek word for humility, tapenos, means crushed and debased. This word was frequently associated with shame and failure. Jesus' disciples had this mentality as well. The Gospels give an account of two of them striving for the highest position of honor within his kingdom. Jesus' response catches them completely off guard. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' humility was not driven by weakness, but by a different definition of greatness, one that valued love, service, and forgiveness. In thinking of a modern example of a king who followed a different path towards greatness, only one king comes to mind, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I don't think there's any single person in the last hundred years who has been more influential or transformational. In his leadership of the civil rights movement, he fought for equality, dignity, and freedom for people who had long been denied those basic human rights. And even though he was frequently treated as a criminal for it, his emphasis on love and nonviolence showed the world that a different way to peace and justice was possible. To get a better sense of the man and his philosophy, I spoke with his niece, Alveda King. I learned the principles of nonviolent conflict resolution from my uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Uncle ML, and my father, his brother, Reverend A.D. King. And to me, often they were like Moses and Aaron. You know, Moses was called to lead a people, and Aaron, his brother, supported him. Both men were ministers, and the chief cornerstone of Dr. King's beliefs was Jesus. As a Christian man, of course, he talked about Jesus Christ, loved Jesus, and followed Jesus. But he never carried a huge Bible and banged people over the head with it. Mm -hmm. But he tried to live that nonviolent example Christ taught by his life. My dad did that as well. This principle of nonviolence was a vital part of the civil rights movement, helping to transform a nation. And that belief was inspired by the way Jesus' life displayed a totally different path to peace. My uncle ML decided to follow Jesus Christ and to take up the weapons of Christ. And of course, that was love, unfailing, unending love, you know, for God, for others, for himself. And so with that powerful force of love that was girded by faith with the methods of nonviolence, he was able to convince others. When people came at him with carnal or regular weapons like knives, guns, dogs, billy clubs, water hoses, bombs, he answered with love. As an example, Alvita told a story from when she was a little girl and had gone to visit her uncle ML at his home. ML had been arrested and he wasn't at home. I was standing praying in the living room, looking out the window. Coretta was in the back taking care of the new baby. ML came in the door and he was tugging at his tie and he leaned against the mantle and then he saw me and he was pulling at his tie and his shirt. He said, Nene, they tried to choke me to death with my tie. But you know, while they were choking me, I decided the more they tried to kill me, the more I was going to love them. So here he has been roughed up, choked, and all he would say is, I love you. Dr. King had a supernatural ability to absorb hatred and respond with love. And he used that love as a force for change. It's interesting that you would use the word force because there is a force of love, there's a force of faith. 
and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used that force to change the world and inspire future generations to continue that fight for change. And Alvita said that sometimes he would talk about knowing that he might not have a lot of time left. But in those moments, he would always lean on his cornerstone. And he said, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And for people who don't have that particular walk that I've chosen, that's okay. Because believe it or not, everybody can start at square one with love. There's nobody on the planet that doesn't need to be loved and who cannot learn how to love. Dr. King endured the hate, violence, and discrimination of his world and decided to respond with love. In doing so, he changed the world. And it was all inspired by his belief in someone who had done the same. Jesus' ultimate motivating factor was love. This was the central tenet of his revolution. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus' death was not a failure of that philosophy. It was the ultimate fulfillment of it. In his gospel, Luke highlights that even as he was dying the most shameful death imaginable, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. On that cross, the true greatness of the kingdom of heaven was on full display. Jesus was crowned as a king because on that cross he endured the pain, hate and violence of his world and responded with his most powerful display of love and forgiveness. In taking an overview of the Gospels, we see that a significant portion of the narrative is dedicated to just the few days leading up to Jesus' death on the cross. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke each dedicate roughly a third of their Gospel to this period, while John's Gospel spends half its time on these few short days. In looking at it this way, it becomes clear that more than anything else Jesus did in his life, each writer felt this event held the utmost significance. This significance is magnified even further when we view Jesus as more than just a king whose death and forgiveness conquered the world. He was also a priest, someone who served as a bridge to God. On the cross, when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This forgiveness extended beyond just to the people who were crucifying him. Just as the high priest asked for forgiveness on behalf of an entire nation at the Day of Atonement, at the cross, this king and priest accomplished the monumental task of forgiving the entire world. In the Gospels, Jesus himself highlighted this as he said when predicting his death, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Forgiveness in the face of death and murder seems just about impossible. But Alvita King witnessed it firsthand when her uncle was assassinated in 1968. But I remember when Uncle Emil was killed, I wanted to blame somebody with all my heart. I wanted to hate somebody. And as she was struggling with that anger, her father, A.D. King, sat her down and showed her a different way. He said, you have to love everybody. And I'm looking at this man grieving. Brother shot down. And he's having to deal with that, but he's teaching me how to love and forgive. That example is especially profound when you consider everything their family had to endure like what happened to them on the night before Mother's Day in 1963. Her mother had just finished getting the house together. She walked and looked out the picture window, and she was standing there quietly, and she writes in her book, the window began to crack. There was no sound, no explosion, but the window began to crack. At that time, Dad, we lived in a ranch-style home. Dad was at the, in the middle of the house in the master bedroom. He says, hmm, he gets up, goes to the front, he says, Nene, let's get out of here, it's too quiet. He brings her to the middle of the house, the whole front of the house explodes. Daddy, A.D. King, Mama, Naomi King, five children in the house. But Daddy got us all out safely. No one was harmed. I remember him standing on a car because the people wanted to riot, they wanted to pick up. They, they would pick up rocks, throw it at the police cars they were driving through. They tried to turn cars over. And Daddy says, he stands on a car, 
Don't, don't fight, don't strike, don't hurt anybody. If you have to hit someone, hit me, but I'd rather you go home. Pray, my family and I are okay. I'm seeing this man, house bombed, wife and children, and he's asking the people, calm down, go home, we're okay. If you give in to hate, violence, and prejudice, if you play their game and respond in kind, you lose everything. On that night, A.D. King showed his daughter that the only way to conquer those forces is through love and forgiveness. Both men may have met tragic ends, but the lives of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and A.D. King were examples of that truth. As Dr. King famously said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He reminded us what it really means to be a king. The Gospel's presentation of Jesus' death is a dramatic portrayal of someone bringing all kinds of people together in the face of overwhelming hate and violence. After he is arrested, Jesus is brought before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the religious ruling class. He is handed over to Pilate, the Roman governor. He is sent to King Herod, the local ruler. Lastly, he is brought before a large crowd of his peers many of whom would have seen him teach, heal, bless, and forgive. Now, they cry out for him to be executed. After he is beaten, he makes the long walk to his execution site, carrying his cross. As he had predicted, he is lifted up on a cross before all kinds of people, men, women, soldiers, criminals, people of various ethnicities and religious backgrounds, many of whom mock him. And in the midst of that shame and agony, Jesus sees his mother in the crowd. He knew that she had no one else to take care of her. In that world, a woman in that situation would have been in grave danger of losing her life. Jesus' heart goes out to his mother, and he tells his disciple and friend, John, to look after her, saying she is now his mother and he her son. In that moment, we see a key part of the gospel message. At the cross, Jesus takes people with uncertain futures in the shadow of death, and because he cares for them, he unites them, creating a new family. On the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. At his death, this king on the cross also fulfills his priestly role, taking a large, diverse group of people, many of whom directly called for his death and forgives them. Like the high priest did in the temple, Jesus on the cross took the sins of an entire people and forgave them, saved them, reconciling them back to God. In the Gospels, Jesus is presented as a king because through his death, he didn't just conquer the world, he saved it. And his death was only the beginning of his revolution because according to the Gospels, Jesus did something truly unbelievable. He conquered death itself. Mm -hmm.